Morning, Daniel. Morning, Abdul. Thank morning. you for having me. Yeah, let me start here. I listened keenly last week to a former general secretary of the party saying he got an assurance from you that you wouldn't be pursuing as leader of the PNP and possible, possibly future prime minister a neoliberal economic model. And he said, you know, that was part of the reason he supported you. Um, what? Give us an idea of um, the kind of politics that you propose to practice at the helm of the PNP and going forward. Well, our tradition, of course, is a party that focuses on social justice and economic empowerment for the entire country, especially the, the masses of the of the people. So we will always be focused on policies that seek to address some of the structural inequalities in the society, some of the things that make life in Jamaica unequal or unfair. But at the same time, we are fully committed to building a, a strong and robust economy and pursuing sustainable and balanced growth. So that is really the uh, in a nutshell, how we would be approaching policy development going forward. We would be interested, for example, in the education system and seeing how we can tackle some of the issues of inequality in the outcomes of the educational system that we have. As you know, there's a wide disparity in performance between traditional and non-traditional schools and significant underachievement in some of the weaker schools and the root causes for that may lie earlier in early childhood development and primary school. So People's National Party government would be focused on how we address those issues so that we can level up the standards going into secondary schools uh, and therefore achieve better outcomes for our children. Yeah, That's well, an example. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, in, in order to be an effective opposition and properly focus and advance on those issues, you have to have a unified opposition. Uh, how, how are things going in that regard? Based on what I see in the public domain, they don't appear to be going too well. Well, the party needs to settle down. Uh, we've gone through a, a devastating general election where we lost badly. You know, now only have 14 seats out of 63 in parliament. Right after that, we went into a presidential, internal presidential election, which completed was completed on the 7th of November. And we will be choosing a new general secretary and a new chairman on the 29th on this coming Sunday. So there have been uh, a number of events which have, you know, I think preoccupied the minds of delegates and NEC members and so on, including two internal contests. So it's not surprising that you may be seeing things in the public domain that suggest that there are issues and there are issues. And one of the main things that I campaigned on, uh, as did Lisa, who was the other contender for the presidency, was the need to unite the party. And we have really focused on how best to do that. And we have established a unity team. Uh, Lisa has recommended three persons to the team, as have I. And it is going to be guided by uh, external professionals in mediation, team building, and so on. And the idea is for that team to coll collaboratively develop a program that will help the party to heal or the divisions that exist not only from the recent uh, elections, internal elections, but indeed from past contests, going back some time. And we've never really, I think, spent enough time trying to focus on healing. And as a result, we have had some issues that have been carried forward over time. And we really need to address those. In the spirit of looking at addressing those issues, raising the specter of unity, do you think announcing your preferred candidate for chairman or GenSec in circumstances where none of your predecessors have done so, have perhaps not done much to engineer unity within the party? Well, I was asked a question on a radio interview and I responded in a open and candid way, which is how I generally operate. However, <clears throat> we are a democratic party and the delegates at the NEC 
those members of the NEC who are entitled to vote have full democratic rights and can express them on Sunday. So I don't think the fact that I may have indicated or did indicate who I would like to see in those positions should affect uh, the choice that is before each delegate in, an, in a democratic process. Yeah, well, I mean, as the, as the leader of the process, um, some folks would submit that it will, in fact, have an impact on who the delegates choose. Other pundits have heard say, if you don't get your choice, you may appear as, as a weak leader. Is, is that something that concerns you? No, because it is not my choice. It is a choice of the NEC members. I indicated who I would like to see, uh, the general secretary and chairman. Uh, those are persons that I've worked closely with for some time now and have a good understanding with and I admire what they bring to the table. But as I've said, it's a choice for the delegates to make, not me, the NEC members to make. So whatever the outcome, one accepts it and one's move, one will move forward. Do you mind sharing with us um, the names of the members of the unity committee? I would prefer not to, um, Abka, if you don't mind, because that has not been yet made public and I don't want to um, in any way interfere in that process. And I'm sure that that will become apparent in due course. Have it. We're going to take a short break here, Mr. Golding, and return to you with some more questions. Thank you for staying. Uh, we are speaking to Mark Golding, the opposition leader. We welcome you back to the front page on Nationwide this morning. I'm Abka Fitzhenry. And I'm Daniel Archer. President Golding, you mentioned the role of Lisa Hanna, indicating that she had nominated three persons to the committee, the unity committee that is being put together. Could you share with our listeners what's the role in mind for Ms. Hanna, given her position, having her having indicated that she's no longer interested in staying on as party treasurer? Yes, well, I spoke to Lisa. We met uh, a couple of weeks ago after the, after the election. We had an uh, open and and um, frank discussion and she indicated that um, at this time she wasn't seeking any particular position in the officer corps but uh, would want to focus on her constituency and work on the ground and that she would be assisting in the local government elections and i respected her wishes and if she um indicates a change of heart or that she'd like to play a more active role at the officer level, we can have that discussion. She's very welcome to be part of the team and is part of the team, but is, wants to, at, at this point in time, focus on her constituency and working on the ground. Having said that, we have now identified what her position is. What's the position of Peter Bunting and other members of the RISE campaign in your dispensation? The RISE campaign is over. Uh, it ended 7th of September 2019 and so I don't really like to speak in those terms going forward because I don't think it's helpful for us to continue to use that kind of terminology within the party but going forward Peter Bonting is going to be assisting me he's a um, senior member of the party and a very able person and so I will be um, relying on him for his support advice and so on and we will see what specific role he will play but uh, like others, he has an important role to play, and if he's willing to uh, play uh, that a role, I'd, I'd be very happy to have him as part of the overall team. On the point on the <laughs> Mr. Golding, there's something I wanted to respond to once and for all. There are some comrades who, and they say it all over social media, in the Observer this morning, Venetia Phillips, for example, quoted as saying, Mark Golding was part of the team that engineered the demise of the PNP. A feeling among some comrades, a lingering feeling that perhaps you and other comrades um, undermined the former leader in order to achieve power. I wanted to respond to that sort of lingering feeling, which I'm pretty sure you're aware of in, in some sections of the PNP. Well, I don't think that kind of discourse is very helpful at this time. There was a challenge in 2019. Uh, as there had been in 2008, where a democratic party and party constitution allows persons to seek leadership 
Now, I, I don't think the fact that there was a challenge means that the persons who participated in that were uh, anti-party or trying to undermine anybody. The, Dr. Phillips was successful in, the, in, in that election. And after that, I consistently supported him. I was his spokesman on finance. Uh, we worked together on many issues. We sat beside each other in parliament. And I have continued to support him right through until uh, he decided to demit office. So I think those allegations are unfortunate and untrue. When we look at the persons who are putting themselves up for being part of the officer corps, in your quest to renew and to engineer unity, would it be in your assessment reasonable for members of the People's National Party who are deemed to have baggage to be successful members of your officer corps? So I, I, I didn't follow the question. Persons who have baggage be for them to be, to be successfully a part of your officer corps. You encourage them to be part of your officer corps when you are on a quest for renewal and you want to engineer unity. But there are persons who want to be part of your officer corps who have baggage, who the public perceives as having too much baggage to be part of the leadership of the People's National Party. Well, as I said, we are a democratic party and whatever the perceptions are around issues like that, ultimately it is the particular organ, in this case the NEC, who will choose who they want uh, to elevate to the position of general secretary and of chairman. And I, I am bound by the constitution as a member of the party, as are all other members. And so we we have to live within the, the that's the landscape in which we operate. And so, uh, you know, that would be my answer to the question. Whoever is chosen by the NEC, we will move forward um, together to rebuild the party. You can say a bit earlier that there are some issues to work on in terms of achieving unity in the PNP. One emerged yesterday, a purported screenshot, allegedly Philip Paulwell in a conversation suggesting that there may be a challenge to your presidency next year. Mr. Paulwell has since publicly denied that. Uh, have you spoken to Mr. Paulwell about that matter? And do you believe him when he denies um, participating in such a discussion or having such intentions? Yes, he and I have spoken. And uh, we spoke yesterday because I, I received that screenshot via a message from other people. And he called me. And he assured me that it was a um, fake screenshot. It was something fabricated and was mischievous. And I accepted him at his word on the matter. So as far as I'm concerned, that, that is a, a non-issue. So you are not bothered by a challenge to your leadership within another year? Well, put it this way. As I've said already, we are a democratic party. So one is always amenable to or susceptible to or we have to deal with things like that. I'm not worried about it, no. Have you asked for the resignation of the opposition senators to give you a free hand? And when do you expect to appoint the one outstanding senator? No, I have not asked for anybody's resignation. We had a meeting uh, prior to the 7th of November. I had a meeting with the senators. We had a discussion around that issue. And uh, we will move forward. Uh, in terms of when I will fill the outstanding post, I just want the... NEC uh, election on Sunday to be to be finished, and then I will make a uh, I will focus on that matter and make a decision as to how I want to fill that slot. What is the likelihood of Peter Bunting being asked to serve in the Senate? It's a possibility for sure. Um, I haven't made up a final uh, decision on the point, but uh, he certainly I is somebody who I have tremendous regard for as a parliamentarian. He has been an effective parliamentarian in the lower house, uh, he is courageous and well-prepared and does what I think opposition parliamentarians should do well. So he certainly would be somebody I'd consider. And as you seek to refocus the opposition on being an effective government in waiting, um, when do you intend to announce your shadow cabinet, Mr. Goley? I don't have a deadline for that. We have an existing shadow cabinet. Um, it's functioning. 
you know, spokespersons are following the issues within their portfolios and are issuing releases. We had a, you know, up to uh, yesterday with this horrible event in uh, Trial Heights, I think it's the name of the community in, in, in Catherine, yes. where a grandmother was murdered and two grandchildren were murdered. You know, our spokesman and national security issued a release on that. We had the Dry Harbor Mountain issued environmental issue involving the Puerto Bueno Mountains, uh, where the Prime Minister, as Minister, I think, has sanctioned the overturning of a decision by NEPA refusing a, a permit to quarry an environmentally sensitive area. Uh, Sophia Fraser Bins, Senator Fraser Bins, who is um, uh, acting as a spokesperson in that position, uh, has, she went and visited the community and she has issued a release on it and that's an issue we will be following up on. So the, the spokespersons are doing their work. I'm going to be reviewing the overall portfolio configuration and there will be some adjustments, uh, but I don't anticipate that that will happen in the next two weeks. I'm, I hope to get to that before the end of December. If okay. we, we'll have a good discussion right here on Nationwide this morning with the opposition leader, Mark Golden. We, we continue in a few. Thank you for staying with us on the front page this morning. We are talking to Mark Golding about his role as president and some of the hurdles that he has to treat with. I want to find out from you, Mr. Golding, in respect of the assessment of the Holdings Administration. You've raised the question about the Dry Harbor Mountain and you raised the specter of the perception of rising crime having looked at this situation in trial. What's your assessment of the administration thus far in your capacity as opposition leader? Well, I'm very concerned about the way in which they've started their new term of office. First of all, from a governance and constitutional perspective, the decision to remove the chairmanship of most of the sessional committees of parliament from the opposition and to alter the numbers on each committee so that they are skewed so heavily in favor of the government side. The combination of those two things has effectively, in my opinion, neutered those committees from providing proper oversight of the, of the executive. And I think that's a retrograde step. I mean, we have come out against it and many civil society organizations also have commented adversely on it. In terms of the performance of the government in the area of crime and violence, well, their main strategy has been to enforce states of emergency in parts of Jamaica, and they've been using that strategy for around three years. However, that strategy is of dubious constitutionality. And indeed, the Supreme Court has ruled that the use of the state of emergency in that way as a crime fighting tool, rather than dealing with the kind of emergencies that are envisaged by the Constitution, is, is uh, unlawful. I know that that is being appealed and we will uh, have to await the outcome of that appeal. But in the meantime, the government needs to design and come with a new strategy for addressing the problems of crime and violence in the society. And we are very concerned. We've had a lot of murders in, for example, central Kingston in, the, in August and, and September coming through to October. We have had this issue, this recent incident, horrible incident at Trial Heights, which these things are all too frequent, as we know. And in our view, there really needs to be a more balanced approach to tackling the issue of violent crime. It cannot just be through repressive measures, whether it be states of emergency or indeed even ZOSOs. What do you propose? Well, we, I think we need to revisit the idea of trying to get to so-called unattached youth and give them a new um, orientation, reorient them towards becoming productive citizens through a program. We had one when the PNP was last in office called Unite for Change, which was quite successful. And we saw in our turn of office, we saw murders trend downwards and are significantly to a level significantly lower than they have been since the JLP took over. And we saw police fatal shootings also for, um, reduced substantially without the use of repressive measures and so on. So I think that they need to 
really focus on programs that will retrain, um, provide remedial education, provide vocational training, mentorship, and guidance to youngsters uh, by providing with a stipend so that they have an inducement to come. And try and, uh, at the end of the day, make them into, you know, give them a new chance in life other than to just sit on a corner and get themselves mixed up in, you know, gang activity and so on. So I really do think we have to approach the issue of, of crime and violence, violent crime in Jamaica, more along the, either, um, the, the lines of a public health crisis where you try and address the root causes rather than the symptoms. Because if you only address the symptoms, which are the actual manifestations of violence when they occur, uh, you're always going to have a situation where you're not going to be dealing with the source of the problem and the problem will continue. Yeah, you have said that, and I want to ask you some questions on, on what you have advanced, Mr. Golding, regarding the issue of crime and violence. I heard um, the security minister hint at it yesterday, so to the police commissioner in, a, in an article published today, um, in their view, the efficacy of the use of states of public emergency as one of the tools, not the entire toolkit, but one of the tools in treating with this issue of pervasive crime and violence. Will a Mark Golding-led opposition PNP oppose the future use of states of public emergency in treating with the what some have regarded as or described as the pandemic of crime and violence affecting Jamaica? I would have to have a discussion on that with the shadow cabinet. We have not yet had that discussion, but I personally did not support the states of emergency uh, after I think January 2019, when I realized that it was not working, and I had have a you know we all swear an oath as parliamentarians to uphold and defend the Constitution of Jamaica, and I we had received a legal opinion from an eminent counsel that said that in in his view the use of the states of emergency as a crime fighting tool was unconstitutional, and the court has now ruled to that effect. So. It, in the absence of a definitive ruling from a higher court turning that back, I don't see how we could possibly support the continued use of states of emergency in the way that they were being used before. Now, the main thing about the states of emergency is the presence that they provide of police and soldiers on the ground to saturate the area and bring calm where there has been a flare up of, of violent crime. You do not need a state of emergency to do that. The, what the state of emergency facilitates is basically indefinite detention of young men without charge. And that is a problem because you it is a, 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 it's a, you cast a net very widely and you, event, and you disrupt the lives of young men in particular, many of whom are never charged and have to be eventually released, having languished in some lockup for a protracted period. That cannot be the way to move forward in addressing the issue. So we, there is a, there is a, a, a group, as you know, that was established, a, a bipartisan group with the input of um, non-political experts looking at crime fighting strategies and so on. And we need that, encourage that group to do their work and produce recommendations. And then we need to execute on those recommendations and ensure monitoring and oversight like we had with EPOC. I think that is a better way forward than to rely on an unconstitutional tool, which is not really a tool because if it's not lawful, it cannot be used lawfully. You've made a distinction between the immediacy of crime because as citizens, we want an immediate response, which is what the SOE by virtue of its imposition would have generated. And then the long-term effect of tackling it like a public health crisis. I'm trying to understand where you are now what can be done now in your capacity as opposition leader are coming from the People's National Party to stem the immediacy of crime as we see now in terms of the brutality? Is there a tool that can be used? Well, first of all, the zones of special operations uh, provide for some enhanced security measures, including the use of the giving the JDF the powers of policemen in the ZOSO so that they can arrest and so on. And we have not uh, criticized that. When the, when the legislation was originally brought to Parliament, we did an analysis of it and we recommended some of the changes which were made. I think that there needs to be a review of that legislation now because it was done hurriedly. 
And I think it, it, um, there are some things in it that could be improved. But in the meantime, we support its use because it does have a social investment component to it, which uh, seeks to establish some kind of sustainability in the reduced crime uh, levels of crime that follow the imposition of a ZOSO. Even without a ZOSO, though, there are curfews. We can deploy the security forces in an area with in, in, in greater numbers and calm the area down. This has been done over the years um, with varying degrees of success. So I don't think a state of emergency uh, as a crime fighting tool is something which uh, we need to rely on. I know that the Commissioner of Police, um, who is a former military man, appreciates the additional flexibility it gives the security forces. But this has to be balanced with our constitutional arrangements. And we have to work within our constitutional arrangements unless we plan to modify our constitution and take away those rights from our people. And we would not be supporting that because we don't think we, we don't want to see Jamaica move to become a police state where people can be just scraped up without access to the courts and held. It could have, any one of us is in jeopardy if we do that. So I think we have to operate within the, the, the confines or the, the architecture of our constitution. And there are ways and means of doing that effectively. I know that there's some legislation plan to give further powers of investigation and so on. And we will be looking at that closely and we hope that we'll be able to support it. When we did the, the, the Joint Select Committee reviewed the anti-gang law, a number of recommendations came out of that, um, of that review. And I think some of those may be informing this new legislation that the government has hinted at. We look forward to seeing that. We'll support anything that makes sense and that is uh, that would help the security forces to be more effective, to help the society address this terrible problem of violent crime. But it must be within the confines of the liberal democracy that we have enshrined in our constitution, which upholds the rights of citizens to due process under law. And as we, we go as we go over the road, we have 20 seconds. What, in your view, are the factors that the members of the PNP, the Jamaican people, should take into consideration in judging the success or lack thereof of Mark Golding's tenure as opposition leader and at the helm of the PNP? I want to be judged by the way in which the party heals from our recent history of internal issues and how we rebuild the organization, how we develop a message, which is a credible message uh, uh, that the Jamaican people will relate to. And it's supported by a, a set of policy proposals that will address the real issues facing the country and the people. And ultimately, our success in the next general election. Thank you much for your time. Mark Golding is the leader of the Opposition People's National Party.